Hello and welcome to the Devoted Outdoorsman's Podcast. Hello, Podcast Nation. What is up? I hope you guys are having a great Memorial Day weekend. This week on the podcast, I'm recording it a little late, but I got a pretty good guest. His name is Chase Schrick, and he is the guy who created the White Pills of Oklahoma Facebook page. So he's going to tell us a little bit about why he created that page, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about uh, filming hunts and stuff like that, too. So, uh, Chase, if you want to introduce yourself, that'd be awesome, man. Hey, everyone. What's going on? It's Chase Schrick. How are y'all doing this weekend? So... You're uh, originally from Oklahoma, correct? Um, no. I, well, I was born and raised in Nebraska till I was nine, and then uh, we moved to Oklahoma, and I've been here, I can't say ever since, um, but been here most of my life, yeah. So when you kind of came up with the idea for the White Tales of Oklahoma Facebook page, uh, where did that kind of come from? Did you see that there was a need for that page or it was just kind of like a, a thing to do for fun? Um, you know, when I started it, um, it was back in about 2014 when I started the group. Um, I'd shot the biggest deer in my life back then, uh, on November 27th. And, uh, you know, I was part of a few different hunting groups on Facebook, and uh, I started posting pictures of my deer. And uh, I had people, uh, you know, bad-mouthing my deer, saying that I poached it, everything else, because it was in velvet, November 27th. Um, but he had one testicle, so he didn't mature right. So basically, I got a bunch of bad-mouthing and, and stuff like that from a bunch of members of other groups. So. uh I kind of sat down and told myself that uh, that's not the way, you know, as hunters, that's not how we should be treating each other. Um, so I wanted to start a group that didn't do that. And uh, a lot of people on my group know that I don't allow that stuff. Um, if you do bad mouth people, then we'll talk to you about it. But, I mean, we've got all kinds of people. We've got young, old women, children. I mean, we've got everybody on that page. And I try to keep it as friendly as, as possible. I don't allow cussing or anything like that. I just want it to be a good run page to where anybody can post any animal they want to. And I mean, it's, you know, Oklahoma whitetails, but I mean, I don't care if people get on there and post pictures of pigs or, hey, we went out and shot some geese or, hey, I just killed this rattlesnake in my backyard. You know, um, I just want it to be a place where people can come and share pictures and tell stories and not have to worry about any kind of bad mouthing or, or backlash off of anything they get. So, yeah, man, I completely understand that. Um, and you know, cause I had uh, James Reese, which is the guy who created, uh, uh, Bow Hunters of America. And he kind of had the same idea. You know, he was a part of a few different pages in the past and, uh, you know, he just didn't really like how, you know, people were running those pages. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we've got a lot of people. I get messages very often uh, from people on the on the page and, uh, you know, asking different stuff like, uh, you know, hey, uh, can I post this? Is this okay? Um, hey, what's your take on uh, using this mineral? Or uh, here's a picture of this buck. I didn't want to post it to the page because, you know, other groups I get, you know, people bad-mouthing, oh, that's a five-year-old deer, and then it just starts this huge – argument you know how old do you think this deer is um you know i have people ask me all kinds of questions all the time which is awesome you know because like i said i want people to feel comfortable in the group and i mean that's what it's all about as hunters i don't really feel like we should be down in each other giving bad advice um if i don't know then i'm going to tell you hey i i'm not real sure i'll look it up you know i'll do some research and get back to you but uh i mean I want everybody to know what they can and obey the laws that, you know, we have here in the state um, because I don't want anybody to get in trouble. I don't want to give someone some bad advice, you know, and uh, then end up getting in trouble because then that, that just, that isn't good for anybody. So you said when you harvested your bucks in velvet? It, it was in velvet, yes. That's pretty crazy. I've heard some stories here and there about that happening. Uh, there was one in Tahlequah, the Tahlequah area, a few years ago where a guy harvested a big, you know, big 10-point buck in, like, I think it was, like, the, 
the third, second or third weekend of rifle season, and uh, it still had velvet on, which I thought was a pretty crazy story. Yeah, I mean, you don't you don't hear of it often. Um, and I mean this, I mean he was a, a once in a lifetime deer for me at that point uh, in my life. I mean, I killed some really nice deer, but uh, you know, I had in my little bucket list. I, you know, I had things like uh, shoot a velvet buck, shoot a drop time buck, shoot a non typical. Uh, shoot one that scores over 140 because at that point in time I hadn't done any of those. Um, so like I said, November 27th, it was cold that morning and, uh, one bullet. Well, I can't say one bullet. I missed the first shot. I'm not going to lie. 300 yards. I was shaking like a leaf on a tree. I knew to aim high. And as soon as I'd seen him, uh, the aim high concept went right out the window. I aimed right on him. I shot. And uh, as soon as I pulled the trigger and that gun went off, my head dropped because I knew that I missed him. Uh, I, j- I had that gut feeling. I aimed right on his heart, pulled the trigger, and dropped my head. I was like, I missed that deer. I looked up through the scope, and he ran around. He turned to the left. He did a big circle, went back about 10 yards, and come right back to where he was standing and stood broadside again and stopped. I pumped another one in. And I was like, you just signed your own tag and uh, aimed right at the top of his back, um, pulled the trigger. And uh, I wasn't using my gun. I was using a buddy's gun. We found out the evening before that hunt that uh, my scope broke. It was done. So my buddy was like, dude, use my gun. So anyway, I shot, ended up hitting him low and clipping his lung. and. Uh, he jumped, kicked when I shot him. My buddy was like, dude, you hit him. And I was like, well, let's go see if we can find any blood. Uh, we looked for half an hour before we finally found blood. And then it was hands and knees for, I think we tracked him for close to a mile before we finally found him. But when we found him, it was well, well worth it. He ended up having uh, 17 points uh, dropped on in velvet, and he ended up scoring uh, 172 and 4 eighths. Dude, that's a stud, and not only is it a just a big buck in general, to harvest a, a deer that's still in velvet in Oklahoma is just, you know, crazy to me. It's, our season starts October, was it October 1st is when our season starts, and normally by, you know, mid-September, they've already shed most of their velvet off if they haven't, you know, if they haven't already started. Uh, you know, yeah, it starts October 1st. So, I mean, sometimes you'll still catch a couple bucks, maybe that'll still have velvet on the back of their rack, you know, like a couple little patches or something. But, uh, you know, yeah, you won't find one in velvet still come October 1st, usually about mid-September. That's, you know, they've already shed their velvet and they're done. Um, You know, if you want a velvet buck, I mean, I think the only state I know of right now that has a velvet season uh, that I've been looking into is uh, Kentucky. And then I heard the other day something I didn't know about is Tennessee has like a early muzzleloader season that uh, it happens. It's like the last week of August or something like that. It's like a two day season. And it's like for antlered bucks only, which they have some weird rules up there in Tennessee. That is weird. I've never heard of that. I'll have to look into that myself. Yeah. And then uh, I was talking to one of the guys, one of the podcast listeners, uh, Glenn, and he was telling me about, you know, some of the rules they have up there in Tennessee. And he was telling me that, you can harvest two antler deer a year, but unlimited does during certain seasons. So, like, during archery season, you can shoot up to three antlerless deer a day. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was kind of thinking. But, you know, when I came down to it, like, you know, I guess they have their own management ways and everything going on up there at the state level. So, Yeah, and we'll see. For me, I mean, here in Oklahoma, we get the four buck tags and two buck tags. And if you put in for the draw, then Those are bonus tags. Um, And really, I mean, I can shoot three deer a year and fill my freezer and not, you know, so I don't, I don't try to overkill um, at all. I've been called a trophy hunter, which is fine. Um, I, I do like my big bucks, but I mean, here in Oklahoma, it's not like a lot of other states. I mean, if I want to put meat in my freezer, I can go shoot a doe. So, I mean, that's kind of where, you know, I sit. We get enough tags here in Oklahoma that I don't even – I've never 
field all six tags in one year. There's no, really for me, there's no need. Yeah, I see it being that way for a lot of people. I feel like, you know, you can shoot, what well, we, we have six, uh, what is it, six deer as a, t- a limit in the F&B. You can shoot all those or you can shoot two bucks. With uh, this past year we had here in Oklahoma, I foresee that uh, we're going to have a lot of people coming in from out of state to hunt uh, big whitetails. So. You know, to have 38 deer um, scored over 200 inches, I mean, that's unbelievable. I don't think, out of my research, that's never happened in any state, period. Um, even in your big deer states. Um to harvest that many deer over 200 inches in one year is just incredible. I mean, and I think, uh, you know, here the past two years, we've had really wet springs, and it's really helped the vegetation grow. Um, so it's given the deer plenty to eat. They've had plenty of water. It's not like it was, you know, what we, what we have, like seven years with without hardly any rain. Uh, ponds, lakes were going dry. Um, so I think that that those wet springs had a lot to do um, with the number of big deer that we've been seeing, you know, like this past year. Um, I may be wrong, but I really think that that's that's the reason why the Oklahoma deer have done so well the past couple of years. Yeah, dude, I honestly, I think that that has a big, big, plays a big role in it. And also another thing that uh, me and George Moore were talking about is, you know, was it, not not last year, so it would be in the 2016 season. We had a really big, like, mass crop. You know, there was lots of acorns. So the deer didn't have to move necessarily as much, you know, to get around to food. So they could stay in those little thick areas with all those acorns because of the wet spring. You know, they had all the, the forbs and everything they wanted until, and then they ate acorns the rest of the year. I, I think so. And, you know, I've, I've taken some advice from George Moore. He's actually the man that, that scored my velvet buck um, up at the Backwoods show up in uh, Oklahoma City. Um, George is an awesome guy. I'm actually supposed to be getting with George. Uh, we're going to do a little uh, how-to scoring video uh, for not only the group, but uh, to share publicly uh, on Facebook and maybe YouTube and stuff like that. But George Moore, you know, he's got some really good advice, especially when it comes to big deer and hunting, and he, he really knows his stuff. So, uh, I mean, I'd take anything that man said and, and run with it because – He's real smart on his deer hunting for sure. Yeah, man. I actually had him on the podcast like uh I don't know, it's been like two two months ago or something like that. But yeah, he's yeah. full he's full of so much knowledge when it comes to whitetail. I mean, he's probably lost more knowledge than I'll ever know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that that's probably true. That's probably true. But I mean, yeah, like I said, he's a r he's a really good guy and he's really knowledgeable. So, I mean I I wish I had half the knowledge that he does so yeah i mean we definitely had a record year this year uh you know i think like you were saying i don't know because i kind of looked into it too I, I don't know that that's ever happened in another state before with that many over 200 inches being being harvested in one year and that's just the ones that you know came up you know those are just the ones that showed up on social media or showed up at the the shows and stuff like that because i'm sure there's other ones out there that you know people are you know a little bit more private about that were harvested too yeah yeah i'm sure i'm sure that there are um and you know that's that's not a bad thing um because i think i don't know how many uh the state department had scored uh, but I know that that was George Moore's count was 38. Uh, the last time I'd seen was was 38 deer, um, which yeah is incredible. I think the most that any state ever had, if my research was right, was five or six in a year. That's around the same number that I was coming up with. Like I looked, I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I asked people, and you know, it was always kind of led to the same thing: was hey man, no one's ever no one's ever scored that many you know, in one year. So we have, we really have no idea. And I was like, well, it seems like a record breaking year for me. So I, uh, that podcast I did with George kind of talking about all that, uh, it was called the sleeper state because, you know, Oklahoma, you know, it was kind of on the radar, radar for, you know, certain people that have been here and stuff like that. But now I definitely think it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, especially when it starts ending up in a bunch of magazines, I mean, you've got people and I think I'm, I hope I don't murder his name. Larry Wheeler, 
super nice guy. She shot the two bucks over 200. And, I mean, he ended up in, in different magazines and stuff, you know, worldwide. And, goodness, he had an awesome year. I mean, goodness gracious. that I couldn't be more happy for a person. I'm, I'm really pumped that, that he was able to harvest both those beautiful deer. I mean, he did an amazing job. So... Yeah, man. Uh, I actually, he was actually one of the first people I had on this podcast. I talked to him in like, uh, I think it was, might have, it was like December or January when I talked to him about it. And, you know, he kind of told the stories and everything on the podcast. And it was very interesting. He harvested not only one, but two 200 inch whitetail over 200 inches within 10 days of each other out of the, basically the same tree. You know, it was, it was <laughs> right in the same. And yeah, you know, I like I looked into that because I was like, dude, that's got to be some kind of record. Like, you know, who has anyone ever done this before? And he's like, I'm not real sure. And I was like, dude, we need to find out because that's that's something right there. I think one of them was like 26 points, and the other one was like 34 or something. Like that. it was some it was some crazy number, which is I was just blown away by the whole story. Um, you know, this is kind of going back to that podcast, but. He, the first one, I think it was the 26 point that he harvested. He shot it and didn't find it for like three days and found it, ended up finding it. I think he said it was like a mile and a half or two miles away from where he actually had uh, put the shot on the deer. Oh, my goodness. I'd have been sick. And that's what I said, man. I was like, there's no way. I would I would not have been sleeping. I would have been out there searching. And he said, he, what was funny about it was he said he was just kind of looking in this last area and uh, he happened to see a skunk. And, you know, the the guy that owned that property was like, hey, man, if you see anything like this, you know, kind of get rid of them. So he's trying to roll. He kind of rolled up, to, you know, after this skunk. And uh, that's how he ended up finding that deer. He said it was just in a big pile of brush. And that skunk kind of let it to him. I was like, dude, that's something right there, too. You know, that skunk was like, hey, man, I found what you're looking for. <laughs> Don't shoot me. I got your deer right here. Yeah, I'm trying to help you out. That's what that skunk was thinking, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, dude, it's crazy. It's crazy. I don't even know what I would do if I saw one deer that big uh, and, you know, just get the opportunity to harvest something or even just to chase something that of that size would be, a, would be a dream. Yeah, yeah. See, well, October 1st, uh, 2017, last year, um, you know, I was hunting this little plot uh, right in city limits. I mean, I mean, well, not in. It's right on the edge of city limits. I spit out of my deer stand and uh, I hit city limits. Um, I've hunted the place for about five years um, and never really had any luck. Um, but last year, I told myself, I was like, you know what? This is the year that I'm going to kill a big deer off this place. Um, I did a lot of homework. There were several bucks that I'd watched for years. Um, so I just figured that last year was my, you know, my year to get it done out there. Um, so I set trail cameras up. I was watching deer, uh, for about a month before deer season. I got real serious about that place. And, uh, I found, uh, what I call the third main bean buck. Uh, he, uh, he kept showing up on camera. Um, I think I only had one daytime picture of him. And, uh, you know, I told myself, I was like, that's the deer I'm going to shoot. He's number one on the hit list this year. Uh, he was the biggest one I had on camera. And uh, I'll be darned, you know, opening morning, I get in my stand. I think I got in my stand at like 3 o'clock that morning. And uh, I sit there, sit there. Sun starts coming up. And uh, right at daylight, you know, I could see deer moving in the field, and right at daylight, I had two bucks. I couldn't tell how big the other one was because I had a branch in my way, but I'd seen the third main bean buck, and here he come. He jumped the fence and uh, off the field and come right in front of me. He hit 20 yards, and he stopped broadside, turned around to look at that other buck. And uh, at this point in time, I really didn't care how big the other buck was, like, you know, the number one hit list buck was standing in front of my stand opening morning at first light. I mean, that was just a dream come true. Um, I flung an arrow, hit him, hit him hard, and uh, he ran to the fence, jumped, almost didn't make it over, went about another 20, 30 yards, and just folded up. He was done. 
and uh I tried to contain my excitement for a little bit um because I knew that there was still another buck right there. Well, I looked over my shoulder and uh I call him Clubhead, and it's the first and only time I'd ever seen him, and he had to be pushing hundred and eighty a hundred and ninety inches and i I never caught him on camera. I never seen him before, and uh it was one of those things. It's like Chase, you've got another buck tag, and it's bow season, so I knocked another arrow, but I just couldn't with where the limb was next to me and how small my platform was on my hanging stand i couldn't I couldn't get a shot off, so I let him walk, and I did get some video of him, and I tell you what he's he's a brute of a deer and uh it's really kind of upsetting. Uh, you know, I ended up losing that place this year, uh, which is fine. But, uh, man, there's still some big deer out there. So, I mean, opening morning last year was just a really awesome season or really awesome opener for me. Yeah, man. The fir- first of September, the end of the end of August, I like to start hitting, hitting the properties pretty hard. I like to run a lot of cameras. Uh, yeah. See, I'm that guy. You'll find me sitting in my gateway, um, doing nothing. I'll just sit in the gateway are up at the top of a hill somewhere with a pair of binoculars. And I'll start doing that about a month before season, and I'll just start patterning the deer. You know, okay, they're coming out over there. They're going in over here. Um, you know, if they're not coming out there, they're coming out over there. Where are they coming out more at? Um, so, I mean, really for me, it's just a it's a strategy game on where to hang stands. Usually by September 1st, uh, I like to have stands hung and uh, ready to go for October 1st. Yeah, man, no doubt. A lot of a, a lot of uh, what happens when you're trying to you know chase mature deer is uh, preparation is the way I like to look at it. You know, it's the deer season, the the killing season is what I like to call it. Killing season starts October first and ends January fifteenth in Oklahoma. The rest of the season is getting prepared for that time of year. That that's what I, I like to think of it as. Yeah, the off season. You know, I like off season just as much as I do hunting season. Um, I learned so much because in the off season I can actually get in the bedding areas. Um, I can, and that, you know, during hunting season, you will not see me walking deer trails. You will not see me going in the bedding areas. You will not see me doing any of that. Um, for the most part, I go to my stand and to my truck unless I shoot a deer. I don't, you know, I try to leave everything undisturbed until the spring when I start doing, uh, shed hunting. Yeah, man, and I think that's a good strategy that will, uh, you know, kind of keep your scent from blowing around in there and, you know, hopefully keep the deer feeling safe. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, man, I got a, I got a, I got a deer that's on my mind, uh, for the property that we started, uh, hunting last year. And, uh, you know, he, we, I never had an encounter with him, but my buddy Josh had an encounter with him. Um, and, you know, he was kind of playing a game with Josh, you know, about five minutes after Josh would leave. You know, to leave a stand, you know, right after legal light, Josh would get out of the stand and leave, and here comes this buck in, like, right after he would come out. Like, right after Josh would leave his stand, that buck would come straight to that feeder and eat and then leave, you know, about five minutes apart every day. And I was like, dude, eventually, eventually he's going to show up, you know, you know, 15 minutes early. Something's going to push him out of his bed, and uh, it never ended up happening. So this past, was it like a month ago, we were out at the property just kind of, getting some ideas of what's going to go on this year. And I was like, I saw this, I saw this tree when I was shed hunting back in January. And I was like, man, that tree, right. So that's, that's the tree that I need to be in because if he comes on that same schedule, which I'm hoping, you know, this is all a theory right now. Cause I don't even know if he made it yet. Heck yeah, man. I hope you get him. It's hard. You know, it's really hard to pick that, that right tree. I mean, and that, that's what it is for me is, you know, you got to find one because I don't like to cut a lot of limbs and stuff like that. So I always try to find one where I might have to clip a few things, but I try to leave everything pretty much untouched. And uh, so finding that one tree where you can get high enough um, and still have a good point of view all the way around you and everything, it's really hard to do. So I hope that tree works out for you. Yeah, my wife, she's making fun of me a couple of days ago because I was like, man, I'm just thinking, well, she's like, what are you thinking about? I was like, man, I'm just thinking about this tree and how I'm going to make it work because what it is, it's in a, it's in an old, it's probably like a 10 acre pen that feeds into a big uh, crop field. There's this one tree and, you know, it's the only one that's really big enough for you to get in. And, uh, I mean, I just got to make it work. So, I mean, we'll see what happens with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, man, do you uh you have any bucks that you're you're hoping or uh, you know for sure made it through the season? 
for this season? Man, you know, and that that's what's sad. Um, the place I, I got both my deer on last year, um, I ended up losing it, which is, is fine. It's not a huge deal, you know, but uh, there was uh, two bucks out there. One of them was really funky looking, like just the way, like, just the way his rack grew, it was just weird. Um, I mean, he was a good typical deer, but then it seemed like every tine had something coming off of it one direction or the other. And, uh, I mean, he just looked really crazy. And I ended up naming him Night Train because I never seen him during the day, ever. Every picture I ever got of him was at night. And, uh, every picture I got, his eyes were glowing. So, uh, I named him Night Train and, uh, he made it through the season. Um, he's going to be, I think last year he might have gone about 140, 145. Uh, so this year he's going to be a stud. Um, and then there was, uh, Blue Moon. Um, he was, uh, he was a huge mainframe eight, um, with a couple kickers. And, uh, he, he made it through the season. Um, he's going to be a stud this year. Um, and I know, I don't know anything about club heads that one I'd seen on opening morning. Um, so I don't know if he made it or not. I'm going to say he did because, like I said, I've only seen him one time. Other than that, he, he must have stuck to the bush because I never caught him on a game camera in front of a feeder. I mean, even on a trail, I never never caught sight of him again. So if he made it, he's going to be a stud as well. But uh, we did get a new place um, about 30 minutes from me that uh, – I have a lot of faith in really thick woods, run through, has a real nice creek that runs through it. Um, and, uh, I've been told that there are some big deer out there. I know that, uh, there's been a lot of pictures posted in the group that, uh, I've seen. And, uh, a lot of those deer come from around that area. So I have really high hopes for this place coming this next year. Well, man, uh, I really appreciate you, uh, you know, taking some time out of your day to record the podcast with me. Uh, we kind of went off on Oklahoma Whitetail, which is, you know, that's good because we've got a lot of listeners in Oklahoma. So uh, we, we'll definitely probably do something in the future. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Awesome, man. Well, you have a great weekend and uh, enjoy your holidays. You too, brother. Stay safe. Mm-hmm.